It's always a pleasure to address this assembly and it's always a pleasure to be back in Madrid. Uh, last time I um, came to Madrid was uh, when we had the, the magnificent uh, NATO summit here in uh, June and uh, I think that both uh, the hosting of the uh, summit and also the hosting of the NATO parliamentary assembly demonstrates the very strong commitment by uh, Spain to our transatlantic uh, alliance. The Madrid summit took some very important uh, decision uh, at the critical time for our alliance. Uh, we uh, made bold decisions on a, a long range of issues and let me just mention a few. We decided to step up our support to Ukraine, further strengthen our deterrence and defense and invite Finland and Sweden to become NATO members. We also adopted the Madrid strategic concept um, uh, to adapt the alliance uh, to a more dangerous and a more competitive world. So the summit in Madrid was really a transformative uh, summit. And now, uh, as we look ahead uh, to our summit in Vilnius in Lithuania next year, we are implementing the decisions we took uh, in Madrid. First on Ukraine. President Putin made two big strategic mistakes when he invaded uh, Ukraine in February this year. He underestimated the Ukrainians' bravery and will to fight, and he underestimated uh, the unity and relentless resolve by NATO allies and partners to support Ukraine. <clears throat> he thought he could um, defeat uh, Ukraine in a matter of days. Nine months later, Russia continues to face setback after setback and Ukrainians uh, continue to liberate their territory from occupation, most recently Kherson. But it would be a great mistake uh, to underestimate Russia. It retains significant military capabilities and a high number of troops. Russia is willing to suffer substantial casualties and is willing to inflict horrific suffering on the Ukrainian people. We have seen drones and missiles uh, striking uh, Ukrainian cities, civilians and uh, critical infrastructure. So we must be prepared to support Ukraine for the long haul. Yes, I know that this support comes with a price. In our countries, many people face a cost of living crisis. Energy and food uh, bills are rising. These are tough times for many. But the price we pay as NATO allies is measured in money, while the Ukrainians pay a price which is measured in blood. And if we allow Putin to win, all of us have to pay a much higher price. Authoritarian regimes around the world will learn that they can get what they want with brute force. <clears throat> this would have direct consequences for our security. It will make uh, the world more dangerous and us more vulnerable. That's the reason why we cannot allow President Putin to win in Ukraine. So we need to stay uh, the course together. And I count on all of you as members of parliament to keep making the case for supporting Ukraine. Second, deterrence and defense. We have been strengthening our, de our defenses uh, since 2014 in response to Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. We have implemented the biggest reinforcement of collective defense since the end of the Cold War. Now we are doing even more <coughs> to prevent the conflict uh, in Ukraine from escalating beyond Ukraine. So we have doubled uh, the number of battle groups in the eastern part of the lines from four to eight, increased our ability to reinforce them up to brigade level and we are putting more troops on higher readiness so they can respond faster wherever and whenever needed. To do all this, we need to invest more in defense. We have already made, as you know, many significant um, uh, uh, decisions and we have made together a lot of progress. 2022 will be the eighth consecutive year of increased defense spending across Europe and Canada. By the end of the year, uh, we will have spent um, well over 350 billion extra US dollars 
on the fence since we made the pledge in 2014 across Europe and Canada. At the summit in Vilnius, defense investment will be an important topic. And I expect allies to continue making progress, including with commitments beyond 2024. Because 2% of GDP on defense should be considered a floor, not the ceiling for our defense investments. Here again, I, I continue to count on your support. Third, resilience. One of the main messages in the Madrid strategic concept is the link between strong defenses and strong societies. The war in Ukraine has exposed some key vulnerabilities. For too long, we have been dependent on Russian oil and gas to heat our homes and fly our jets. And we have seen how Russia was, uh, has weaponized energy and tried to use it to blackmail us and to prevent us from supporting Ukraine. But Putin has not succeeded. Allies are now diversifying their supplies. We are moving away from fossil energies and investing in renewable uh, sources. This is good for our security and it's good for the climate. But we need to be careful not to uh, create new dependencies, most notably on China. We see growing Chinese efforts to control our critical infrastructure, supply chains, and key industrial sectors. Chinese rare earth minerals are present everywhere, including in our phones, our cars, and our military equipment. We cannot give authoritarian regimes any chance to exploit our vulnerabilities and undermine us. For this, it is essential that we boost the resilience of our societies and our infrastructure. Resilience is a collective effort, and I count on you all to play your part here too. Finally, Finland and Sweden. In Madrid, all allies made the historic decision to invite these two countries to join NATO. We signed the accession protocols, and now the ratification process is almost completed with 28 out of 30 allies having already ratified. In Madrid in June, Turkey, Finland and Sweden signed the trilateral memorandum. Finland and Sweden have delivered on their commitments. They are strong partners of a joint fight against terrorism. So the time has come to finalize the accession process and to welcome Finland and Sweden as full members of NATO. <laughs> this will make our alliance stronger and our people safer. We must also step up our cooperation with our partners near and far, with those most affected by Russian aggression and coercion like the Republic of Moldova, Georgia, and Bosnia-Herzegovina, and with all like-minded countries around the world, from Latin America to the Middle East, and North Africa to the Indo-Pacific region. We share security interests and face the same challenges. We can and should tackle them together to defend freedom against oppression, democracy against tyranny, and to uphold the international rules-based institutions that benefit all of us. So President Connolly, dear Jerry, I know these values are dear to you. NATO is dear to you. And as president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly over the past two years, you have done an extraordinary job to make the transatlantic bond and NATO even stronger. You and I, we have worked uh, together and I have enjoyed our excellent relationship. I thank you for your remarkable leadership of this assembly. And I look forward uh, to working with your successor, uh, Senator Gazza Mayam, uh, 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 to prepare for the uh, Vilnius summit next uh, uh, July. So thank you so much for excellent cooperation. <laughs> and with that, I'm actually ready to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Great.
job. Thank you so much. Um, so again, I ask people please to be disciplined and try to frame your question in one minute so that we can maximize answers. Um, we're going to do, as we usually do, take three questions, uh, questions in, uh, three in, in a row so that Secretary General can, uh, can try to uh, answer them also efficiently. So the first three questions are Zaida Cantera of Spain, Yehor Chenyev of Ukraine, and Julie Jesuits of Canada. Uh, Zaida, you go first. Thank you very much, Yuri. I speak Spanish. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Welcome to Spain. I hope that once again you have been warmly welcomed. Uh, by the Sp and on behalf of the Spanish delegation that I represent, we have grave concern, as conveyed here uh, so often, about uh, the Ukrainian peoples. We know the three pillars we need to, to uh, win a war. We have enough freedom of action, the capacity of execution and the maneuvers, and one that is absolutely ascension, that is the will to win. The will to win of the Ukrainian people is being proven, and it seems unbreakable. But winter is here, it's coming, and today in the, differ in the media we can see how the first snowfalls uh, are, are, are falling uh, uh, strongly, and uh, this affects the civilian population hardly. Uh, they lack the energy, the water, uh, because they have been cruelly um, uh, destroyed by Putin, so they, it's difficult to confront this hardship. What are we going to do in NATO to support the Ukrainian people and their willingness to win not being used um, to uh, make the Ukrainian people sit down and negotiate? Thank you so much, Saida, and thank you for staying with us. Time limit. Uh, Yehor? Solomia. Ah, Solomia. Yes, thank All right. you. Mr. Secretary General, um, that's a question from, from Ukraine, I see here. Um, uh, the, very, the very simple and clear um, uh, question and message don't you think that's at the high time to denounce the founding act on mutual relations, cooperation, and security between NATO and the Russian Federation, which was signed in Paris? once in 1997. I think we faced um, totally 150% new reality. And this founding act is no more, um, can be valid since even 2013. How we will face the new Russia, how NATO will face the new Russia after finally he'll be, it will be defeated. Thank you. Thank you, Solomia. And finally, uh, for this set, Julie. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. And uh, Secretary General, I want to say a huge uh, thanks uh, to you for your extraordinary leadership during these unprecedented and troubling times. Um, it, was our, our, it was our honor uh, to welcome you to visit the Canadian Arctic earlier this year. It's the first time a Secretary General of NATO has ever done so. Can you speak to uh, the next steps for NATO in strengthening Euro-Atlantic security in the Arctic? And the second question I'd like to ask is, the warfare of the 21st century is increasingly uh, very different than the past, with, with the increase in the acceleration of cyber attacks, interference uh, in our uh, elections and democracy, uh, misinformation, disinformation, and foreign actors in our country uh, threatening our citizens on our, oil, on our own soil. So I'm talking about these uh, Chinese police that's setting themselves up in, in countries like the UK and Canada and others. What are your thoughts on how prepared NATO is uh, to address this new warfare? Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Uh, first, to the question from um, uh, Spain about uh, the situation in Ukraine and also the possibility for negotiations. So first of all, the only answer to your concerns is to ensure that uh, NATO allies uh, are uh, stepping up and providing more uh, support. Because, yes, you are absolutely right, winter is coming and Russia continues to attack, to use drones and missiles to attack 
uh, critical infrastructure, and we should not underestimate uh, the capabilities of uh, Russia also to uh, continue the war. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, that should only motivate even more support. I welcome the recent announcement by Spain to step up uh, support to Ukraine, including with air defense uh, systems, uh, Hawk batteries, but also other types of support, uh, and also many other uh, NATO allies um, uh, and partners uh, around the world have uh, recently made uh, additional announcements, uh, and including NATO is stepping up what we also do when it comes to winter clothing uh, and, uh, and fuel and, uh, and other things, uh, tents and other uh, uh, types of supplies that will enable the Ukrainians to also operate throughout uh, the winter. Then on negotiations, uh, of course, we all want this war to end, but we need to remember what this is. This is a war of aggression, where one country, Russia, has invaded a neighbor, Ukraine. And therefore, it, it matters how those negotiations are uh, conducted, and we need to realize that uh, this war most likely will end at some stage at the negotiating table. But we also know that uh, the outcome of those negotiations are totally dependent on the strength on the battlefield. So if we want an outcome which is acceptable for Ukraine, an outcome that ensures that Ukraine can prevail as a sovereign, independent, democratic nation in uh, Europe, the best way of achieving that is to provide military support to Ukraine. So if we want, a, if we want an acceptable, peaceful, political solution, we need to provide military support to uh, Ukraine. Uh, because uh, as, as we all know, if, if President Putin stops fighting, then we will have peace. If uh, President uh, Zelensky and Ukrainians stop fighting, then Ukraine will cease to exist as an independent democratic nation in, in, uh, in Europe. So yes, we want negotiations, but we also want an outcome that ensures uh, a sovereign independent uh, Ukraine and ensures that uh, a brutal use of force is not uh, awarded. Um, then, um, then the question from uh, Ukraine. We have to understand what has happened. It is correct that for many years NATO strived for a um, better and, and, and constructive relationship with, uh, with Russia. Uh, we established the NATO-Russia uh, Council, the Founding Act, and in the, and in the uh, strategic concept we agreed in Lisbon in 2010, as the, the strategic concept that was actually valid until Madrid June this year, uh, we refer to Russia as a strategic partner. That has totally changed. In the strategic concept we agreed in Madrid in June, we refer to Russia not as a strategic partner, but we refer to Russia as the most imminent threat against NATO allies. And uh, that's also the reason why we have invested so much in our collective defense and why NATO allies have uh, uh, provided unprecedented military support to Ukraine. Russia has walked away from uh, the uh, initiatives, the, the, uh, the, the structures that we established uh, to develop a more constructive uh, uh, relationship with Russia and to have a meaningful dialogue with Russia. So as long as Russia continues to behave in the way they behave uh, now, and especially against Ukraine, uh, there is no way we can have a meaningful dialogue with uh, Russia. Then on Canada, yes, you are right, I had the privilege, the honor of being the first Secretary General of NATO visiting the Canadian High North. Um, that was, uh, for me, uh, an important visit because I was able to see uh, firsthand uh, how the High North is important, of course, for Canada, North America, but also for the whole alliance. Uh, the shortest way for Russian missiles to, uh, uh, to hit uh, the North American continent is not over the Atlantic, but it's over the North Pole over the high north. So the, the, the cooperation between North America, uh, or between the United States and Canada, uh, NORAD uh, up in the high north, where I was able to see some of the sites, is critical for the, for the defense of North America, and therefore also for the whole uh, NATO alliance. Uh, the high north has become more and more important, partly because Russia has significantly increased their military presence, reopened all Soviet era uh, bases, infrastructure, uh, deployed more uh, uh, submarines, more uh, advanced nuclear uh, weapons, uh, and also because we know that the high north, the North Atlantic, 
That is about the vital link between North America and Europe, and NATO is about that link. So to protect the high north, to have presence in the high north, uh, is absolutely essential for the whole alliance. The last thing I will say is that NATO, of course, is presence in the high north. Seven, seven out of uh, eight Arctic countries, uh, of the eight members of the, north Atlantic, uh, of, the, of the Arctic Council, are NATO members, or soon to become NATO members, Finland and, uh, and Sweden. So uh, NATO is also, of course, an Arctic alliance. Uh, you had one more question, that, uh, yeah, that was China. Well, as I said, uh, resilience, the protection of our societies, our uh, infrastructure, is now very high on the NATO uh, agenda. And again, the, the Madrid summit reflects uh, a huge change in the, uh, in the previous strategic concept. China was not mentioned with a single word. In the current strategic concept, uh, uh, the, 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 the challenges that China poses to our security, to our values, to our interests, uh, is addressed. And part of that also is to be aware of how China is coming closer and trying also to uh, control uh, critical parts of our societies. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. The next three questions are Mike Turner from the United States, Osman Bak from Turkey, and Mimi Kadeli from Albania. Mike. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Secretary General, thank you. You have been a strong, unwavering, uh, and unambiguous voice on the issue of Ukraine. I appreciate the, the fact that you have been that international strength. Uh, my question to you is about the strategic concept. In addition to Russia's aggression against Ukraine, their uh, nuclear black, uh, blackmail, their threatening uh, capitals of, of NATO nations, uh, it needs to be, I think, an additional focus uh, on paragraph 21 in our in the strategic concept, missile defense is raised. As you know, NATO, unfortunately, has and, and NATO allies individually as a policy have not aggressively pursued missile defense because they saw it as, as um, provocative. Uh, now, obviously, uh, it is almost um, in defense malpractice not to, to pursue uh, missile defense. Israel has proven that it, it is both cost-effective, works, and de-escalatory. I wondered if you'd talk for a minute about the need for NATO and NATO allies to pursue missile defense. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Osman. Thank you very much, uh, dear Mrs. Uh, Secretary General. The Grain Deal was, I'm here. The Grain Deal was rec recently renewed in Istanbul for a further 120 days. Although Russia had threatened to withdraw from the agreement, finally the Russian blockade on Ukraine ports remain, remains removed, allowing safe passage to grain ships to World markets. The renewal of the Grain Deal is clearly a diplomatic success. Exchange of uh, prisoners of war in Istanbul was another important achievement. Uh, I would like to know uh, your comments on the implications of these steps for the future and what steps we should take to avoid food crisis and secure the food supply to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Osman. And uh, Mimi. Thank you, President. A part of all the military actions that we are having, I think that only through the Parliamentary Assembly, NATO can express its full potential. So we are a community of values, united in our commitment to parliamentary democracies, individual freedoms, human rights, and rule of law. It is our obligation to engage, rise awareness, and support our governmental and intergovernmental defense and security structures. So I think that by doing so, as, I, um, as uh, our colleague Osman mentioned, mi military actions, diplomacy, and raise up our parliamentary assembly position, do you think it's gonna be a better way to afford this Russian aggression and this situation we are all together living in. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi, and I thank all of our six questioners so far for staying within their time limit. Really appreciate it. Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Uh, first, uh, um, the question from, uh, from Mike Turner um, uh, um, uh, on air and missile defense. First of all, it's always great to see you. Uh, and. Um, 
And uh, uh, you're absolutely right that uh, uh, air and missile defense uh, is, has always been important, but it's becoming even more important, and we see the devastating effects of missiles uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, uh, NATO has stepped up what we do on uh, our integrated air and missile defense. Many of the systems are, you know, both for 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 cruise and for ballistic missiles um, and uh, we are investing more and especially uh, many of the fifth generation aircrafts are extremely important as part of an integrated air and missile defense um, just after invasion we have significantly increased our presence in the eastern part of the alliance uh, on land at sea and in the air and all these uh, uh, domains are uh, areas where we actually have significant also uh, air and missile defense uh, capabilities. Uh, both our planes, uh, but also our ships have uh, uh, air and missile uh, capabilities, which are extremely uh, valuable now. Uh, and, uh, and we can quickly reinforce, if needed, with more planes and more uh, ships in uh, particular. Um, uh, and also here in, the, in Spain, you have the Rota base where the ages, uh, uh, US Aegis um, uh, ships are based, and they're also, as you know, uh, important for, uh, for uh, missile uh, uh, defense. So I, I just I, I take note of what you say. You are right. We need to do more, and we also need to discuss the, the, the design and how we, how we integrate the different NATO capabilities to ensure that we get the maximum uh, air and missile defense out of uh, what we invest in um, in uh, in our missile and air defense systems. Um, then, uh, um, Turkey, uh, Osman, it's always great to see you. Uh, we actually we met in, in in Istanbul, but we also met here in Madrid uh, at the summit, and you were in the room where we negotiated the agreement with Finland and uh, and uh, and Sweden. Uh, and uh, and you also know that when I visited uh, Istanbul uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I, I commended uh, Turkey and President Erdogan for the grain deal, uh, uh, which uh, Turkey facilitated, uh, and uh, that has proven extremely important, and also the extension of, of the grain deal. Actually, when I was in Istanbul, I saw the ships with grain passing through the Bosporus, uh, and this is important for the food prices, uh, especially for uh, the poor countries of the world. Uh, so the grain deal has proven extremely important, and we must ensure that it continues. Uh, also, the agreement to have exchange of prisoners of war is something uh, that uh, Turkey uh, and President Erdogan facilitated, and of course, also much welcomed by uh, allies. But, uh, and you also know that my message uh, when I was in uh, Istanbul was exactly the same as my message here today: is that um, uh, Finland and Sweden uh, have delivered on the, the trilateral uh, memorandum, uh, so the time has come to finalize the ratification process and. Uh, uh, I will continue to convey this uh, message, as I also continue to convey to Finland and Sweden that, of course, they have to uh, engage in a long-term uh, partnership with NATO uh, in general and with uh, Turkey in particular uh, on the fight against terrorism. Therefore, also welcome the permanent mechanism that has been established as part of the uh, uh, memorandum uh, to ensure that, uh, uh, in particular, Finland and Sweden continues to work closely with uh, Turkey also in the future. Uh, to fight terrorism, because you know that no other NATO ally has suffered more terrorist attacks than Turkey. And we saw the, the brutal terrorist attack in, in, in Istanbul just a few days ago, uh, a stark reminder of the brutality of terrorism uh, uh, and the ca casualties that inflicts on uh, allies, and, but in particular uh, Turkey. Uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, Albania, uh, Mimi. Uh, no, I think you're absolutely right that values are, of course, the core of this alliance. And um, and, uh, and we should uh, never forget that. Um, uh, let me also add that I think also parliamentarians, and you as NATO parliamentarians and parliaments in general, they are extremely important now. Because we need to ensure that uh, when uh, NATO governments are ready to continue to provide support to Ukraine, that they have the support from the parliamentarians and from their voters. There's no way we can... Uh, 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 stand for long haul, provide support for uh, Ukraine for months and perhaps even years if we don't have the support from you. So uh, you actually play an extremely uh, critical role in ensuring the support from parliaments and from the voters for uh, uh, 
sustained support from NATO allies to uh, Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Our next three questioners are Anne Genete of France, Luca Fruzzone of Italy, and Salima Belhaj of Netherlands. And Salima, I want to thank you for a wonderful gift of tulip bulbs from Holland, which I will plant this spring. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anne. Mais, thank you very much, Mr. President. Je vais m'exprimer en français. Monsieur le Secrétaire Général, Mr. Secretary General, with the new brutal and justified aggression of Ukraine by Russia, our alliance must now face a major strategic shock. It has been able to respond to this shock and therefore has been able to reestablish its legitimacy. We have been able to anchor the principle of a defensive material support in a sustainable way to Ukraine, which is decisive in order to support the Ukrainian people, which has been very very courageous and very resilient, and this is something that is of great impression to us. I have been, uh, we also see that this support is complemented by the European Union, which is also working to help the Ukraine with material collective assistance, namely thanks to the European Peace Facility. I think that this complementarity will be enhanced once Finland and Sweden will be part of NATO. So what do we need to do in order to accelerate this? Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Luca. Thank you, Mr. President. In the coming months, Russia, taking advantage of winter, will try to stock up on weapons, especially missiles. The role of sanctions will become even more important in constraining their supply chain. However, we have seen that shortages of semiconductors and raw materials can also affect allied country, especially if we consider China's monopoly on rare arts or critical materials. You already mentioned that, uh, Secretary General, but there does not seem to be an advanced awareness of this yet. So I wonder how member countries can jointly improve those aspects relating to supply chains and what the role of NATO, which for me is fundamental, can be in all this. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Um, and Salima. Thank you, uh, President. On behalf of the Dutch delegation, I express our solidarity with the Ukrainian people in its resistance to Russian aggression. We continue with our support for Ukraine, also in the establishment of a special tribunal. We were glad to hear yesterday by the Prosecutor General of Ukraine, Ms. Kostin, that the recent verdict of the Netherlands court on downing of the MH17 last week is of a great importance in holding Russia responsible for the committed crimes and that these experiences in the MH17 case will be used. I would like also to thank NATO, you as the Secretary General, and our allies, especially our friends from Poland and partners, for the calm response to the missile incident in a Polish village that killed two people last week. In such situations, it's of most importance to remain calm, investigate, and not unnecessarily escalate the precarious situation or jump into conclusions prematurely. We hope that the Secretary General can um, tell us uh, how he sees this, but also uh, how he sees in the future, um, if incidents happens, we can stay calm. Thank you, Salima. Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Uh, first uh, to, to France and Anne. Um, uh, yes, uh, I very much welcome uh, the support by, uh, by, by uh, from France, uh, but also from uh, other uh, 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 countries uh, to to Ukraine, and I also welcome, of course, the efforts of the European Union, including through the European uh, Peace Facility. These are efforts that are complementing what uh, uh, NATO allies are uh, doing, uh, and together we are able to provide unprecedented support to Ukraine. Uh, but also, as you alluded to or indicated, uh, NATO allies and partners uh, and the European Union are not party to the conflict. What we do is that we uh, support Ukraine's uh, uh, self-defense. Um, uh, Ukraine has the right to defend itself. That's enshrined in the UN uh, Charter, and we are helping them to uphold that right. That does not make us party to the uh, conflict. Um, uh, then, uh, then you asked me about uh, how can we then further 
uh, strengthen what we do as NATO and the European Union when Finland and Sweden joins uh, the EU. Uh, well, I think that only makes it even clearer that we have a lot in common, because uh, when Finland and Sweden joins uh, uh, NATO, uh, then, uh, then, uh, then, of course, also then 96%, almost 100%, or 96% of the people living in the European Union, they will live in a NATO country. Uh, so, of course, it becomes even more obvious that uh, 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 NATO uh, is uh, the core for, uh, or the, fun of the, 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 the basis for our collective defense, for our uh, security, and, uh, and the need for NATO and the European Union to work even more closely uh, together. Um, uh, then, uh, uh, Italy and, uh, and Luca. Uh, again, uh, let me thank you uh, uh, for what Italy does to provide support to Ukraine. Uh, uh, I'm very impressed, uh, actually, well, uh, about what uh, so many allies have done over uh, such a long uh, uh, time uh, to provide uh, different types of uh, support. Uh, but you asked me about the critical components, um, the, the, the risk of um, uh, uh, having a, um, uh, not safe or not stable and not reliable uh, supply uh, uh, lines or, 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 or chains of supply. Uh, and that's exactly what we now are addressing, are addressing at NATO. Uh, because we have uh, seen so clearly that we cannot be dependent on uh, or too dependent on authoritarian regimes when it comes to critical commodities, uh, critical components. Of course, we will still trade with China but we need to be aware of the vulnerabilities that too heavy dependent on specific uh, commodities, products can create. Uh, and that's uh, 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 something which has now been uh, addressed in, 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 also in NATO. We just convened them for the first time in NATO's history, a meeting of our senior officials on resilience to coordinate this, because even if these issues normally are regarded as economic and um, and trade issues, they have direct implications for our security, and therefore we need to address them also as a, as a, uh, as a NATO uh, alliance. Um, uh, and, uh, and there is no way, I think that not so many months ago, we actually uh, had a discussion about whether gas from uh, Russia was only a commercial issue or a commercial issue with direct security implications. And I think we all have seen that uh, to be the, too dependent on Russian gas also has security implications because Russia is weaponizing the export of gas. And only back in 2019, we had a big discussion among NATO allies whether 5G uh, and also whether uh, the Chinese company Huawei, whether that was only a kind of uh, a commercial economic issue or whether who actually controls 5G networks is, yes, it is an economic uh, and a commercial issue, but it is an economic and commercial issue with huge security uh, consequences. So therefore, we also need to take into account security considerations when we de decide on 5G. So the awareness about these issues have increased enormously in NATO. We need to do more. We need to develop guidelines. Uh, we have some resilience guidelines. We need to improve them. We need to coordinate. We need to share information to ensure that we don't uh, uh, see once again what we have now seen with, with Russian uh, gas. Um, then, uh, Salma, um, um, uh, also the Netherlands. Um, um, yes, also the, the missile incident in Poland reminds us of the fact that wars are dangerous. Uh, two people were killed in Poland, and, and in wars, accidents happen. And uh, therefore, it is extremely important that we are. Uh, vigilant, that we monitor very closely, but also that we uh, react in a calm and measured way, but also firm way, as we did after the incident uh, in Poland. Um, the incident is ongoing, so uh, there are no absolute final conclusion, uh, but uh, uh, we have no indication that this was a deliberate attack. We don't have any indication that, uh, that, uh, that this was a Russian missile, and uh, so far, uh, 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 we have <coughs> um, uh, the most likely uh, uh, reason is uh, that uh, it was uh, a Ukrainian air defense missile that fell down in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Poland. But let me then add the important thing, and that is that Russia bears the responsibility. Because we, what we do know with certainty is that this wouldn't have happened hadn't Russia 
invaded Ukraine and hadn't Russia the same day launched roughly 100 missiles against Ukraine. And of course, Ukraine has the right to defend themselves. So the responsibility for this is Russia's. And, uh, and no, also the, the, in, the, we, we welcome, and, and we welcome also the fact that Poland and, uh, and Ukraine are now working together on the investigation. That's fine. It's important. And we need to find out exactly what happened. But it doesn't change the political reality that it just highlights the importance of Russia ending this war as soon as possible and stop attacking Ukraine with missiles and drones. Thank you. Uh, our next three questioners are Jiri Horak. Of, Czech, of the Czech Republic, Theo Franken from Belgium, and David Johan Vadafull from Germany. Yeri. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, dear Mr. Secretary General, I'm interested uh, in your view of the future of Allied defense spending. Uh, since it will be discussed at the Vilnius Summit next year, I would like to know your prognosis. Uh, are there plans to increase the pledge from 2% of GDP or a rate to make rules as to how the money is spent? Thank you. Thank you. Theo. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question about uh, Sweden uh, and Finland joining our, our alliance. I think it's very important to, uh, to show a unity that means that we cannot delay uh, their membership. So for uh, my question is, uh, are there extra external diplomatic efforts that are taken to convince Hungary and uh, Turkey to, uh, to, to, uh, to accept and to vote the membership in their parliaments? I understood from my uh, Fidesz uh, colleague yesterday that Hungary will vote the 7th of December, so that's good news. But Turkey, they have, uh, Turkey, they have elections also, so I, I hope it will not take one year to have that vote. Uh, we need to show unity on all the, uh, uh, and show all efforts to get them in, because we need Finland and Sweden. It's, it's in their interest, but it's also in our interest of our alliance to get them as soon as possible in our alliance. They're most welcome. Uh, from our point of view, we had voted this in Belgian Parliament within weeks. So thank you very much. Thank you, Theo. David. Thank you, Chair. Can I use the opportunity to thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for your exit ordinary service in our alliance uh, and that you stayed in, in this post, though there were alternatives for you personally. Uh, really, you're the, I, 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 I think you are the, the anchorman of, of our alliance. My, my question is that the uh, Russian attack on Ukraine also learned as uh, a new lesson that the status of being partner of NATO does not deter a potential Aggressor. What does that now mean for our NATO relationship to other partner states like Georgia? Thank you. Thank you. And again, all of you concise thank you. Mr. Secretary General. First to the Czech Republic, and GD, about the defense spending. Yes, I believe that defense spending will be an important, uh, very important issue at the Vilnius summit. I cannot uh, tell you exactly what allies will agree when it comes to uh, uh, formulating the, the, the pledge uh, for defense spending for the next decade, also uh, because we finalized now the, the pledge we made in, in 2014 for 2014 to 2024. Uh, but uh, I expect that it will be as an even stronger commitment to increasing defense spending. And, uh, and I expect that in one way or another, uh, um, uh, even though perhaps the 2% will be kept, it will be kept more as a kind of floor than a ceiling for defense uh, uh, spending. Uh, but these are negotiations that will go on, uh, but I'm absolutely confident that uh, the ambitions will be increased uh, in one way or another, uh, uh, because everyone now sees uh, the need for uh, investing more, uh, and we also welcome that allies that have been below 2% now are setting new and more ambitious targets, and more and more allies are investing more, just because the world is more uh, dangerous. Um, then you asked me about how to spend. Yes, also, well, we have the NATO defense planning process, which, is, which ends up the very specific capability targets for each and every ally. So, uh, so there is a link between uh, the ambition of spending more and the targets we agree 
uh, for different capabilities that allies need to provide uh, with, uh, with uh, more, more heavy equipment, with more uh, air defense systems, with higher readiness, and many other specific defense uh, capabilities that uh, allies uh, should provide according to the agreed NATO uh, capability targets. Uh, uh, then Belgium and Theo. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, also, well, there are, also the, the Swedish uh, uh, Prime Minister went to Ankara, I have been in Istanbul, met with the President Erdogan, and, and of course we have a good uh, conversation with the Indian Alliance uh, on the ratification process. Uh, then let me just remind you of the following, that so far the accession process for Finland and Sweden has been the quickest ever in NATO's modern history. We have to understand that it has hardly happened uh, quicker every, any, any time before. Uh, because um, Finland and Sweden applied in May, and then just a few weeks later in June, all 30 allies agreed to invite them to become members, and a couple of days later, all 30 allies signed the accession protocol. And already 28 out of 30 allies have now ratified. This is very fast, extremely quick, has not happened before in NATO's modern history. So, so, so uh, yes, of course, I would very much like the two remaining allies to ratify, and, uh, and I have expressed that uh, uh, many times, uh, but uh, we have to understand that this is so far very uh, a quick uh, process. Let me also add that Finland and Sweden are in a very different place now than they were before they applied. Uh, because since they applied in May, several NATO allies, including the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, and many other European uh, allies, have issued security assurances to Finland and Sweden. NATO has increased its presence, and 28 allies have already ratified, and all allies have signed the accession protocol. So it's absolutely inconceivable that if Finland or Sweden are subject to any kind of coercion or aggression by Russia against their countries, that NATO will not act. So it's not as if nothing has happened. They are extremely close to us. Uh, they have received security assurances. And Finland and Sweden participate in NATO's military and uh, civilian activities in many different ways. So yes, I want the finalization of the accession protocol but we have already achieved a lot just by what allies have done since uh, they applied. Um, then um, Germany, David, you point out a very important point, and that is, of course, that we have a responsibility as allies, uh, of course, to protect uh, uh, each other as NATO allies, but we also have a responsibility to ensure that our close partners, especially those who are most vulnerable for Rus of uh, Russian coercion and aggression, like Georgia, that already uh, uh, have experienced Russian military aggression back in 2008, that we support them. And I strongly believe that as long as we don't uh, 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 achieve uh, or we are, we are not able to, uh, to, to, to get full membership for these countries, then we should at least provide them with significant support. If there's any lesson from Ukraine, is that we, have support, we should have supported Ukraine even more, even earlier. I would like to praise those allies that actually helped and supported Ukraine since 2014. NATO provided some support, uh, some capacity building, some training, but we could have done more before, before the invasion. And that's exactly the same with Georgia and other countries that are our close partners. But I remember, for instance, uh, I, I, I went to Yavoriv, which is a training site uh, in West Ukraine, uh, not so far from uh, Lviv. Uh, and there I saw, back in 2015, the United States, Canada, uh, but, also, uh, but also United Kingdom, uh, providing extensive training to Ukrainian forces. And of course, this training has been extremely important now, uh, after invasion. So if anything, we need more support for Georgia, more support for, uh, uh, for Moldova, more support for other partners at risk uh, now. That's the lesson learned from Ukraine, and you have to help me because then we need money from your parliaments. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Um, our next three uh, questioners are Trond Helleland from Norway, 
uh, Matej Tonin from Slovenia and Najal Fridbetson from Iceland. Tron. Thank you, Mr. President. There, uh, Jens. I ask you this uh, question in Brussels three days before Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine. Now the circumstances have changed. Norway shares a land border and a long maritime border with Russia. And we have long been the NATO's eyes and ears in high north. Now we wholeheartedly welcome our Nordic brothers, Sweden and Finland, into NATO. The accession of Sweden and Finland will be good for the alliance as a whole and for all the Nordics. Now we get a longer border with Russia uh, the, because of Finland's long border. But Norway will still be the only country in the region with a maritime border to Russia in the Barents Sea. At the same time, NATO membership for Sweden and Finland will, might also change how we currently think about supply routes across the Atlantic, defense planning in the Nordic region, and the relationship between the High North and the Baltic Sea. How, in your view, will Sweden and Finland's NATO membership affect NATO's and Norway's role in the High North? Thank you. Thank you, Tron. Matej. Honorable Secretary General, dear Jens, uh, thank you for your extraordinary leadership in this demanding time. It was a privilege to cooperate with you in the last three years. Finland and Sweden are security contributors. It is in our interest that both countries become a full NATO members. Months ago, it seemed that Sweden and Finland won't become NATO members because of blockade. At that time, you stepped in and facilitated the dialogue. Can we expect from the Secretary General to step in the process again and accelerate it if needed? Thank you. Uh, Najal. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, President Connolly and Mr. Secretary General. We are all aware of that the uh, Arctic is becoming increasingly important in its strategic security and economic dimensions. As Russia's invasion of Ukraine ends a post-Cold War era of low tension and cooperation, such events highlight how hard it is for states to monitor their own waters, particularly in the high north. With Finland and Sweden joining seven out of eight Arctic Council states, will be NATO allies, which I believe will directly affect Russia's calculus and possible responses in the region. While our common goal is stability and cooperation in the Arctic, we must consider the possibility of Russia deciding to employ a more confrontational force posture in the region, as well as in the Baltic. Can you elaborate on that possibility and NATO's role in that region? And finally, it goes without saying that Iceland strongly supports Finland and Sweden's imminent application for membership in NATO. Thank you, General Secretary, for an outstanding job. Thank you, Nigel. Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Uh, I think actually I will uh, answer the question from Iceland and the Norway, from Njol and from Trun uh, uh, together, because uh, Partly because Iceland and Sweden used to be, no, Iceland and Norway used to be the same country uh, for many hundred years ago, uh, before the Danes uh, come and uh, came and uh, created some problems there. Um, uh, uh, and, but more importantly, because actually because you asked uh, about the same issue uh, about Finland and Sweden and and the High North, um, and uh, and and fundamentally, Finnish and Swedish membership will strengthen NATO in the High North. There's no doubt. Uh, because Finland and Sweden are extremely capable uh, countries. We know that because they have been very close partners uh, with NATO for many, many years. They have advanced uh, 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 systems. They have, uh, Finland has a large uh, army. Uh, they have uh, advanced defense industries. They have high-end capabilities. Uh, so, so, and, and they have well-organized uh, 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 defense forces. And, uh, and strong democratic institutions. Uh, so they have, therefore they have been our closest partners for many, many years. We have worked together with them, we have trained together with them, so we know them well. And therefore it's no doubt that uh, they will uh, strengthen uh, NATO uh, 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 throughout the alliance, but uh, of course in particular in the north because of the geographic location in the north. Um, uh, this will also help us uh, to both increase our presence uh, uh, in, um, 
in uh, in the Barents Sea in the in the high north. Uh, you are right, Trond, that uh, Finland and Sweden they don't have any coastline uh, to the Barents Sea or the, the North Atlantic, but they have significant air uh, uh, capabilities uh, that can help us to uh, patrol and monitor uh, also up in the high uh, north, uh, and of course also have naval capabilities that can uh, be deployed up there. Um, um, and, and, and of course, especially Finland um, with the long border, uh, also has, has a knowledge uh, about Russia, which is unique. Uh, by when Finland joins the alliance, NATO's border with Russia will more than double. Uh, so the Finnish border with Russia is longer than the total existing NATO-Russia uh, border. So, so all of this uh, will, of course, uh, enhance our ability, both to deal with the challenges in the high north, but also in the Baltic. Because again, if you just look at the map, we have always been concerned about our ability to reinforce uh, the Baltic, uh, uh, and we had the Sovalki gap uh, with Finland and Sweden in the alliance. Uh, it will uh, uh, change very much the geography uh, when it comes to NATO's presence in uh, the Baltic. Uh, so, um, so um, uh, it, uh, it, it, there is no doubt that uh, their membership will be good for NATO allies in many different ways, and therefore welcome them. And uh, Mateus uh, from Slovenia, it's good to see you again. Uh, we met often uh, in the ministerial meetings, but now um, uh, you asked me about whether I will step in. <laughs> I've never stepped out in a way that, uh, that I have been uh, working hard for, for, for enlargement of NATO since I arrived. First with uh, North Macedonia, no, sorry, first with Montenegro, uh, then with North Macedonia, and then with Finland and Sweden. I like my family or our family to be bigger, and they, when they are candidates, we, <laughs> we work on that. Um, uh, uh, and, I'm, and I'm glad that first we had two members from uh, uh, the Western Balkans, and now uh, we will have two new members from the uh, North. Uh, all of this is strengthening uh, NATO across the board. Um, uh, then, yeah, so that's in my answer, whether we will step in. Then, let, but let me add one more thing, and that is that the and I engage, of course, with Finland, I engage with Sweden, I engage with, with Turkey. Um, uh, but let me remember that, or let me remind you of that, the, the trilateral agreement that was signed here in Madrid in June, that was a trilateral agreement between Turkey, Finland and Sweden. NATO didn't sign. We were in the room, Osman again, you were there, yeah? Uh, but I didn't sign. I only welcomed the signing of the others. Uh, uh, so, so meaning it's a, it's a trilateral agreement between those three countries. So at the end of the day, it's those three countries that have to ensure the full implementation. Um, uh, but I welcome that Finland and Sweden has delivered. And, and then I just uh, think that the time has come for, uh, for uh, uh, finalizing the ratification. Uh, then, uh, no, then that's all three. Because I lumped Finland and, uh, sorry, uh, two of them together, uh, Iceland and Norway. And that was important to learn about that Iceland-Norway thing. <laughs> the Secretary General faces many challenges in this uh, tumultuous world, but uh, he's already handled 15 questions from this body. Um, so thank you for your patience. Uh, we got three more. Ante Bakish from Croatia, Arta Bilali Zandeli from North Macedonia, and Mati Redma from Estonia. Ante. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Secretary General, Dobardan, and greetings from the Croatian delegation. You know, you know, last month we held the first parliamentary summit of the International Crimea Platform in Zagreb, and which brought together 48 speakers of parliaments and presidents of interparliamentary organizations, like our president from NATO PA, Mr. Connolly, was there. In Zagreb, we proudly demonstrated support to Ukraine, and I would like to hear your comments and thoughts about how to politically approach another issue that in a way bothers NATO and the EU in the Southeast Europe. It is an issue of uh, somehow, uh, somehow stalled NATO's political outreach in the Western Balkan countries. I mean the political interaction and, and practical cooperation with regard, you mentioned the country Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also in Kosovo. The interaction do exist, but the feeling is that everything that has been done in the past has been overshadowed by the malign foreign influence. 
that keeps these countries blocked in a kind of endless limbo and miles away from the further alignment with our common values and political posture. In terms of Bosnia, Herzegovina and Kosovo, what else beyond being simply vigilant can NATO do in order to counter foreign political goal, goal of undermining those countries and preventing them to become more stable and secure on the path, on the path of the EU and NATO? Thank you. Thank you, Ante. Um, Arta. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, before the war, we all thought that Russia has very tight links with China. And now, somehow, China is out of the picture. We, see we saw recently some strong cooperation between uh, Russia and Iran. But again, I will repeat, China is out. My question is, where do you see the role of China in the picture? And uh, how do you assess its not active role or position after the war or after the Russian invasion in Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you. And Mati. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, dear Secretary General, my question addressing, again, air defense issue. Today's uh, genocidal war by Russia in Ukraine is a clear testimony that Russia violates all international rules and agreed principles and inhuman and unacceptable attacks on the population and civil infrastructure without any military meaning is today's new reality. I call all NATO members to make greater and faster efforts than today to support the military capability of Ukraine. The future of not only Ukraine depends on it, but the future of all of us. In connection with a new reality presented above, uh, the need to secure also the missile and air defense capability of NATO, especially the territories of its eastern flank, is getting a new and broader meaning today. Also, the need for more force action plan. Could you share your views on this matter? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Uh, first uh, to Ante and, Kos uh, and, and Croatia on the Kosovo and Bosnia. Uh, as, as you know, uh, the, the Western Balkans matters for NATO. We have a long history there. Uh, we helped to end the two uh, uh, brutal uh, wars, uh, first in Bosnia and later on in, the, in Kosovo, Serbia. Uh, and we also helped to, to stabilize uh, North Macedonia uh, uh, yeah, almost 20 years ago. Uh, and we still have a presence. Uh, we have our headquarters in Sarajevo, we have the office in Belgrade, and of course we have the K4 forces in Kosovo, and uh, we also have now several members uh, in, in the region, full-fledged NATO allies. I mentioned uh, North Macedonia and, uh, and, and Montenegro as, uh, as uh, two of our newest uh, members. All of this makes uh, the Western Balkans an important region for, uh, for NATO. Uh, on Co in Kosovo, while we continue our presence, uh, we, uh, we support uh, by our military presence the EU-led efforts uh, for a, uh, a diplomatic solution. Uh, we support uh, the, the belgrade pristina dialogue, the, uh, and I think it demonstrates actually how well NATO and the European Union can work together, uh, complementing each other with the NATO forces supporting the EU diplomatic efforts uh, in, uh, in Kosovo. We also work closely with the EU in Bosnia and, Her and Herzegovina. And at the Madrid summit, we uh, decided to step up uh, political and practical uh, support for our partners in, um, in, uh, in the Western Balkans, including Bosnia and Herzegovina, and to help them to uh, uh, resist uh, malign influence uh, from, from, from Russia. Uh, we uh, are also stepping up our support to Bosnia and uh, Herzegovina in different way, in or in different ways, in order to uh, to help them, including by uh, more and uh, uh, an enhanced uh, defense capacity uh, building, a new uh, package of def defense capacity building efforts for uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, to help them to implement its plans for moder modernization of it uh, of its defense and security institutions. Um, uh, we are working closely uh, to help them. Uh, it's not easy, uh, but we will continue uh, to uh, do what we can uh, to help to address the instability and the challenges, and including the malign in influence of especially Russia in the region. 
Then Arta, North Macedonia, the role of China uh, related to the Ukraine conflict, if I understood the question right. Well, uh, first of all, uh, we have called on China, and that was also my message when I met with the Chinese Foreign Minister uh, in, um, in New York during the UN General Assembly, that China should clearly condemn the illegal Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. They have not voted in favor of the different UN uh, resolutions doing so, uh, but we call on them to do that. And also, of course, we regret uh, that, uh, that just days before the invasion, Russia and China signed the joint declaration of President Putin and, and President Xi signed this joint uh, uh, declaration uh, where they stated that uh, the partnership with Russia and China, between Russia and China, is without limits. Having said that, of course, we also welcome that China, uh, at least uh, so far, has not provided any military support to Ukraine. This is important. No one should support Ukraine. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Russia, uh, uh, in their efforts to, to occupy uh, Ukraine. No one should provide uh, support to Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and that has also been a clear message uh, from NATO allies to, uh, to uh, China. Then, um, uh, Mati on, uh, from Estonia on air defenses. Well, uh, air defenses is extremely important. Uh, but I think sometimes you need to realize that air defenses is partly land-based systems, uh, like the Patriot batteries or the SAMT batteries and these land-based systems, or the NASAMs, which I've seen uh, very effective in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. But air defense systems are also very often based on ships, uh, and they are extremely capable and very mobile. And also, of course, uh, planes. Uh, um, our jet fighters are also an important part of our air defense systems, partly with the sensors, but also uh, uh, partly because of their capability to intercept incoming missiles or, or, uh, or uh, uh, um, uh, other types of air uh, attacks. So uh, the fact that we have significantly increased our presence both on land but also at sea and in the air uh, in the Baltic region and in the east and that we can very quickly reinforce if needed. I visited recently uh, the USS uh, um, uh, uh, George H. W. Bush, uh, uh, the, the aircraft carrier. It was based in the Adriatic Sea, but those capabilities on that aircraft carrier supported by ships from Italy, from, uh, from, uh, from Turkey, from many other NATO allies, they represent a huge uh, uh, capability also when it comes to air defense. So, uh, yes, we need to do more on air defense, but we should not underestimate the capabilities we already have in place and also our ability to reinforce with air and naval uh, assets quickly if uh, needed. Thank you. Doing all right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, our next three are Zolt Nemeth from Hungary, Anna Maria Katata from Romania and Raymond Bergmanis from Latvia, Zolt. Thank you very much, President. I am right to you, Secretary General, uh, right to you. Uh, I would like to greet you in the name of the Hungarian delegation uh, and express our gratitude for your work and for your presence here. Uh, I think you have been instrumental in maintaining the unity of the alliance in the past period, and I would like to congratulate you on that. Uh, my original question would have related the Western Balkans, but probably you have covered it uh, more or less in the previous round. So uh, I would like to ask you a question which uh, relates the uh, uh, European uh, political community. Uh, on the 6th of October, uh, uh, President Macron uh, has initiated this new format. And uh, in the Council of Europe and in parliamentary level, we are uh, fighting with this uh, challenge. Uh, uh, what is the role of this organization relating to the Council of Europe, relating to NATO? And uh, I think uh, uh, it is just uh, in the formation. And may I ask you if you have any position uh, personal position, because probably not yet official one. Uh, how do you see the relationship between NATO 
and this new European format, uh, which targets at uh, security aims as well, it seems that uh, the security dimension of this European political community is quite decisive. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Zolt. Anna Maria. Thank you so much, Mr. President, Secretary General. Um, the summit in Madrid marked a very important moment for the alliance in general, but also for the eastern flank. And with the new battle groups that will be uh, in place in, uh, for different European countries on the eastern flank, including Romania, the deterrence and defense of the eastern flank will be more balanced, and we are... Um, uh, we are very excited about having them fully operational. But you mentioned earlier the lessons learned from Ukraine. And my question would be in terms of a more multi-domain perspective, what will the Vilnius summit discuss on the difference and defense of the eastern flank, including cyber, including space, and why not including uh, maritime security and the, the free uh, flow of trade? Thank you so much. Thank you. Raymond. Yeah, Mr. Secretary General, I'm not going to repeat what Russia did and continue to do in Ukraine. But my question is about uh, security of Russia's neighbors, namely the Baltic states. Thinking, uh, taking into consideration that one of the major subjects for our NATO PA, Defense and Security Committee for next year will be evolving Baltic Sea security. Could you elaborate on that? How the NATO started to work on the new plans for security of the Baltic states and after full accessions of Sweden and Finland about plans for the security of the all Baltic Sea region. We hope and we would like to believe that both our colleagues, Sweden and Finland, will be able to participate in the next NATO summit as full-fledged members. By the way, next summit will be held again in the Baltics, this time in Vilnius. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Uh, first, uh, the question from Salt uh, Hungary uh, on uh, the European uh, political uh, community. Well, as a <clears throat> NATO allies and, and also non-allies uh, that were present there, uh, of course, they, 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 they meet in different uh, formats and in different uh, organizations and institutions. And I think, in general, it's good that, uh, that, that um, allies uh, and, and uh, close partners in Europe meet in uh, different uh, uh, ways. Uh, as long as we all are aware of that the bedrock for our security remains NATO. Because the bedrock for our security is transatlantic. And there is no way that can be replaced. Uh, I, I, as I said many, many, many times before, I, I welcome uh, European efforts on defense. And I welcome EU efforts on defense, uh, uh, on, uh, on providing more capabilities, uh, PESCO to address the fragmentation of the European defense industry, uh, or the European Defence Fund and, and, and many other uh, efforts. That's, that's very uh, important and, and, and something I welcome. And of course, any meaningful strengthening of uh, uh, European defences uh, requires more defence spending and NATO has been calling for increased defence spending across Europe for years and now that's happening and that's a good thing. But this can only complement, not uh, replace NATO. Uh, because uh, two world wars and the Cold War taught us that our security is totally dependent on the North Atlantic link, on the North Atlantic bond, uh, Europe, uh, North America, and, uh, and Canada uh, together. So, 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 uh, and I don't, and, and I'm very different. Glad also that the message is that this is not a, a, any alternative to NATO. This the aim is to complement uh, and uh, and to strengthen. Uh, what we do uh, 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 together. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think also we have seen that in Ukraine. Of course, the, the reality is that there's a support from the United States and North America to North American countries has been critical for the gains that Ukrainians have made. Uh, and also the fact and also the fact that, that is especially Canada and the United States, they have been there since 2014. They have th trained tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers. 
Uh, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, you have also allies uh, that have supported Ukraine, uh, especially since the invasion, but we need to do, to do this as North America and Europe together. Um, then, um, then on uh, Maria, uh, Romania, uh, well, the multi-domain uh, approach, of course, will be a part of what we uh, 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 address in uh, Vilnius, uh, as it has been actually for a long time. Uh, we have to remember that we are very much aware of that uh, any military conflict in the future involving NATO allies, especially in a large-scale conflict, will be multi-domain. It will not only be land or sea or air. It will be land, sea, air, and cyber, and space. And space and cyber is integrated in everything we do. Our land operations, our uh, 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 operations at sea and in the air are totally dependent on cyber, of course. And cyber and our communications and targeting and a lot of things that we do on land or on Earth is dependent on, uh, on space capabilities, satellites, GPS, navigation. So, so, so there is no way to not be multi-domain. We have to be multi-domain in everything we do, and that's also reflected in uh, our new plans and, and the decisions we have made, both on cyber and space, establish them as a new um, military domains alongside air, air sea, and land. Uh, then, uh, Ramon, great to see you again. Uh, uh, Latvia always, uh, of course, focused on the Baltic region. As, of course, when Finland and Sweden joins, uh, we will also then uh, adjust our defense uh, plans and, uh, uh, and, and our defense planning processes to take that in, into account. And without going into details, partly because some of these plans are quite secret, uh, it, it, you know, it's everyone that looks at the map understands that it has a huge impact on our ability to protect and defend uh, the Baltic region. Uh, and, and, and that increases our deterrence. And by doing so, uh, we are further reducing the risk on any attack on any NATO ally. Uh, because the, 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 the purpose of NATO is not to actually, uh, 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 also the main purpose of NATO is to preserve peace, is to prevent an attack. And the stronger our deterrence and defense is, uh, the more uh, likely it is, or the less likely it is that there will be any attack. And therefore, I welcome also Finland and Sweden as members because it will strengthen further our deterrence and defense uh, across the lines. Thank you. Um, our, our next three uh, questioners are Risto Gatchev of Bulgaria, Mikhail Sherba of Poland, and Lord Hamilton from the UK. Is that a cheering section for you, Lord Hamilton? Okay, Risto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, uh, first of all, I, I would like to say that the newly elected uh, go uh, Parliament in, in, in Sofia, one of the first uh, decisions that, uh, that we made was to, uh, to make a decision to send direct military support to, to Ukraine. And I think this is important uh, for, for our country to do. Uh, I have two quick questions uh, following the time. One, you mentioned a couple of times the air defense. Uh, you mentioned the air defense in the Baltics, but what about the southeastern flank? Should it be reinforced after the incident in Poland uh, last week? And the second uh, question is, what is the possibility of joining the efforts between NATO and the EU uh, on uh, resilient, resilience capacity building uh, between, uh, between the, two, uh, the two organizations? As you mentioned, uh, most of the EU citizens will live in NATO countries after the accession of uh, Finland and Sweden. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mikhail. Mr. Secretary General, General I'm here. Uh, thank you for your strong leadership in these uh, difficult uh, times. Uh, we should be prepared for more hostile actions against Ukraine, but also against NATO states. Russia's aim are to weaken us, diminish our determination to support Ukraine, and we can't fall into Ukraine fatigue mode. Even Today, this morning, our assembly has shown responsible u unity and soon will give a strong message of solidarity with uh, Ukraine in our resolution. Russia's actions against Ukraine are escalatory, and last week the massive attack on Ukraine's infrastructure was the largest since the beginning of the war. Recent incident in Polish territory is also 
a result of this escalation. Ukraine needs more Western advanced precision weapon, and we ask NATO governments for it. Two questions to you, Mr. Secretary General. In reference to escalation, how NATO can strengthen its military presence in the eastern flank? A lot has been done, but we should, what should be the next steps? And the second question, do you agree we need a re to, reflect, to reflect better on threat from the territory of Belarus? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Lord Hamilton. Secretary General, you've um, emphasized to us how essential it is that the war is won um, in Ukraine um, and, and that the Russians are beaten. This would have happened already if we'd imposed a no-fly zone in uh, Ukraine. People who are worried about a no-fly zone say that we would be inevitably in conflict with the Russians. That is because the air defense systems are the other side of the Russian border. We could create a cordon sanitaire, which meant that we were out of range of air defenses um, in, in Russia. Um, and so what is the chance of, what's the military argument for um, imposing a, a no-fly zone? Surely it's quite possible to do this. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, first, uh, Risto from Bulgaria, um, uh, air defenses um, um, uh, in the Black Sea region. Uh, well, as we have, we have increased our presence also in the Black Sea uh, region, and as I said several times, uh, this includes also air defense capabilities, and, uh, and with, uh, uh, with our air and naval capabilities, it's also easy to quickly reinforce. But let me just add one more thing, and it's not as if NATO has some kind of uh, unlimited access to uh, NATO air defense systems. Of course, what we are dependent on is that allies provide air defense systems and that we pull them together. So, uh, if anything, it just highlights the importance of allies meeting at least a 2% target and also delivering on the NATO capability targets uh, to be able to provide the necessary capabilities uh, to uh, uh, increase our air defense uh, um, uh, of NATO territory and our ability to reinforce. Um, so this, this is what we do, uh, and, uh, but uh, we are totally, as always, totally dependent on allies to deliver on, on, on what they have promised. Then you asked about NATO-EU. Um, I think I've already said some, some few words about that, but let me just add that, again, especially with Finland and Sweden inside, 96% uh, uh, of the people living in the EU will live in a NATO country. That makes it just even more important that we avoid duplication. Uh, that uh, what the EU does uh, is complementing uh, uh, NATO efforts, and of course, and of course, yeah, also, also I, I'm, I'm personally a strong supporter of the EU. I've tried to convince the Norwegian people to join uh, uh, EU uh, twice and lost twice. So, uh, so, so, but I am arguing in favour of EU as I believe in the European Union as a concept, as an idea. Uh, but at the same time, we just need to realize that, that there are also many... Euro First of all, we have North America, we have Canada and the United States, and they, they're not small nations, they actually contribute to our shared security. But second, we have also some Europeans who are outside the European Union. There, there, is more, there, is more, there is more Europe in NATO than there is Europe in EU. There are 450, you know, there are 450 million Europeans in the EU, and that's 600 million Europeans, uh, Europeans in NATO. So, 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 so it's not, we need to ensure that we work together in NATO to address uh, the security needs for all allies, uh, inside or outside the EU. I welcome EU efforts, but it doesn't replace NATO and it must not duplicate NATO. Um, uh, uh, and I say that as a really a strong friend of the EU and also uh, I'm proud that as Secretary General of NATO, I have been able to work together with the presidents, the leadership of the European Union and also the different uh, EU members to lift NATO-EU cooperation to unprecedented levels. Uh, 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 then, uh, 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 Mikhail from Poland, uh, you mentioned Ukraine fatigue and that's extremely important what you said. And that is, we must prevent that from happening. Uh, because uh, we, can, we, can, we cannot allow President Putin to win. And he should never, never believe that democracies are, in a way, 
not resilient, not, are not able to sustain an effort over time. And as I said, this is because it will be a catastrophe for Ukraine, but it will also be extremely dangerous for us. Because then, then the lesson learned will be that by using force, he gets exactly what he wants. Uh, so this is also about our security interests. Uh, but to prevent any fatigue, to enable us to continue to support, at the end of the day, there's only one thing that, uh, that depends on, and that is the support from our public. So we need the support, and you are closer to them than anyone else, because you are elected representatives uh, from your different constituencies. So, so I do what I can. I travel around and argue in favor of support to Ukraine. But I, you need, and I know that you do that, but we need your support uh, in the different uh, uh, member states, allies, to ensure that people understand why we need to pay a price to ensure freedom and democracy, and that is in our uh, interest. Uh, then, um, uh, yeah, then, sorry, you asked also what, what, what we will do to further increase. So, first of all, we have doubled the number of battle groups from four to eight. Uh, we did that after uh, the, as we have done that over the last months. Second, uh, what we agreed in Madrid is that we have to be able to scale these battle groups up to brigade, uh, brigade size level. We will start to exercise and test that. And the way we do that is to have earmarked forces. For instance, Germany have now earmarked a brigade that can be uh, deployed uh, to Lithuania on very short notice. They will exercise uh, and so on. So there will be a close link between those so forces and the ability to scale up uh, the brigade or the battle group to a brigade uh, size on very short notice. Second, we are going to pre-position more supplies and more equipment. And again, you see in the war in Ukraine how important supplies, ammunition, equipment is. Uh, and thirdly, we will increase the readiness of forces. So where needed, we can deploy forces uh, quickly. And then there are a wide range of other things we will do on, uh, on, uh, on air, uh, um, Naval capability, cyber, that also matters for the defense of the eastern part of the uh, alliance. Then, uh, Lord Hamilton, also on the no-fly zone. I, I am aware that this has been an issue. It was raised at the beginning of the war. Um, um, uh, I think that for allies, it is important that we are not party to the conflict. Uh, and if we started to deploy forces, uh, into Ukraine, uh, we would uh, become party to the uh, conflict. But allies are uh, very determined uh, to help Ukraine defend their own uh, uh, airspace. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what they have done uh, by providing all the air defense systems, the ammunition to the air, air defense systems. The UK have done that, extremely important. Uh, but also, uh, but also the fact that uh, they are providing training. Again, UK is leading training efforts. I just visited the United Kingdom, and I met there with uh, uh, British trainers, but also with trainers from Denmark, from, uh, from Lithuania, from Canada, from many other countries that are helping to train Ukrainian soldiers uh, also uh, uh, with air defense capabilities. Uh, in the United Kingdom as a joint effort by many NATO allies, and the and, and United Kingdom has actually provided training to, 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 to Ukraine since 2014, uh, and this makes a huge difference. So we will help them to protect their airspace, uh, and that's the way uh, we will ensure that uh, they are able to shoot down Russian missiles, drones, and, and, and strengthen their control over their own airspace. I thank the Secretary General. I would only note that we had no-fly zones in Iraq, uh, in the north and in the south, and we in fact did engage with and shoot down Iraqi aircraft. Um, and so the risk of engagement when you have to enforce a no-fly zone is very real. Uh, and, and our goal is to constrain and end this war, obviously, not to expand it. Um, our last, if you're willing, our last three questioners are Manousis uh, Volodakis from Greece, Hans Wellmark from Sweden, and Miko Savola from Finland. Manousis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. General Secretary, you said that the uh, accession process of Sweden and Finland 
has been the quickest yet. Nevertheless, it might be not quick enough because it is the only one that has been going on while war rages on in our backyard. Uh, Finland and Sweden, uh, and moreover, there, there, there are no procedural issues with this. There are political issues, uh, in particular Turkey's objections. Finland and Sweden had to declare the something that's a self-evident truth to most of us, that they do not nurture terrorism. Five months have passed and we still see no progress. To the citizens of member states, uh, the, the, the question is raised, what is going on? Uh, are there any concerns regarding the ability of Finland and Sweden to counter terrorism? Thank you. Thank you. Hans. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thank you that the Secretary General remind of the special relations between Iceland and Norway. Let me remind the Secretary General of the special relations between Sweden and Norway. If the gentleman would suspend, we cannot hear the question because of discussion. If you're going to have discussions, I would respectfully ask you to take them out of the plenary session. The gentleman may resume. Thank you. Well, let me remain, uh, remind uh, the Secretary General of the special relations between Sweden and Norway. We shared a kingdom for 100 years. Um, and we are very fortunate, fortunate to have very good neighbors, but we also try to be a good neighbor and a good ally, and that is also our intention, together with Finland inside NATO. We see ourselves and Finland as security provider into NATO, and we also have this broad concept on security. It's on the hard defense, but also on the fight against terrorism, and therefore I hope that in the uh, coming days we can also convince Turkey of this uh, trilateral agreement that we are delivering on it. Uh, and I really want to ensure that Sweden and Finland also taking with us and transmit all the good words, all the friendly cheering uh, and the support for our, our countries into NATO because uh, I think that uh, uh, everything is linked to each other. So the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea and High North are linked to, together and therefore we're going to be a provider of security. So in Swedish, tak, in Finnish, kitos. Thank you, Hans. Nico. Thank you, Mr. President. It's easy to continue what, what, what the brother from the Sweden just said. I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for support in our goal of becoming a member of, of NATO. And I also want to thank you all, wonderful colleagues here, partners and friends welcoming us to the Alliance. Almost all of you have ratified our membership uh, in, our, in, in your parliaments already, and you did it very rapidly. As the Mr. General, Secretary General said, uh, this has been the fastest, fastest process ever. Um, maybe one more, once more, uh, one question to Mr. Secretary General. Um, Finland and, and Sweden wants to be the security pro providers in, in the NATO. Uh, in Finland, we have a strong conscription army with over 900,000 reservists, and uh, we are spending now that over 2% of the GDP to the defense cost. So, uh, so you particularly answered the question already, but how do you see the future role of Finland and Sweden in the NATO defense policy planning? Thank you all, wonderful colleagues, and Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Um, first uh, to uh, Malusis from Greece um, on, uh, on uh, Swedish and Finnish membership. Uh, well, as a, there is a process, there is a dialogue, um, uh, and I'm confident that uh, Finland and Sweden uh, uh, will become, also the, they are already invited, we already signed the accession protocol, but I'm confident that we'll be able to finalize the the accession process uh, uh, within a reasonable time. I will not speculate exactly when, but the sooner the uh, uh, better. Uh, but as I've said already, uh, Finland and Sweden are in a very different place now than before they applied. <clears throat> it matters that uh, all allies have ex uh, signed the accession protocol. It matters that they are now participating in NATO's military and civilian structures. It matters that, uh, that several NATO allies have 
uh, issued uh, security assurances, and matters that NATO has increased its presence uh, in, uh, in the region. Uh, so uh, it is absolutely inconceivable that uh, uh, there will be any kind of aggression against Finland and Sweden without NATO acting. So, so it's not as nothing has happened, a lot has happened all, uh, already. Um, then we also have to remember that no other ally has suffered more terrorist attacks than Turkey, and they have the right for self-defense. Uh, and, 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 and they have some concerns, they've raised them, uh, and, uh, and now they are addressed by Finland and Sweden, and I welcome that very constructive uh, process. Um, then Hans from Sweden, yes, uh, you are right, uh, we are good neighbors, and for uh, roughly 100 years we had uh, the same king. Uh, the, the more surprising thing that the first common king we had was actually a French general, uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, uh, who actually ended up as a Swedish king. And the last time Sweden was at war was against Norway, uh, and since then... It has been very peaceful, and then you uh, join NATO. So this is a... a little more bitterness yeah, coming no, out No, no, it's not bitterness. The strange thing with the Nordic countries is that they have been fighting for centuries, and now they are best friends, and they can joke with it. That's a good thing. Uh, so, uh, but you're right, and, and you're right that, that, uh, that, um, that the Nordic countries are all very close neighbors. They work very closely together, and, and, and of course, it will uh, strengthen also the cooperation in the high north, uh, when uh, uh, all the countries are part of the same security uh, alliance, uh, part of, uh, of, of NATO, uh, and, uh, and that, uh, that's, that's something that uh, yeah, will benefit the whole uh, uh, alliance. Uh, then uh, Nico Finland, you also spoke about the membership. Uh, yes, I say it, it will. By being together in NATO, uh, we can work so uh, even more closer together uh, uh, and, 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 and I think it's important also to convey the message to the rest of the alliance that this is not only good for the Nordics, but it's good for the whole uh, alliance. Uh, it's obvious when it comes to the Baltics, uh, the, the eastern part of the alliance, because uh, we have then much better ways to reinforce that part of the alliance if needed. But it's also critical for the whole transatlantic uh, link, because by increasing our uh, uh, strength in the high north, we also strengthen our capability to protect the vital uh, links of communications, the sea lines uh, uh, across the, the, the uh, North Atlantic. And that is exactly what is binding North America and Europe together, and which is the, uh, the fundamental link uh, within the NATO alliance. And I also know that Finland and Sweden, they are ready to participate in different NATO missions and operations. They have been in Afghanistan, they have been... Uh, in, 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 in Iraq, they have participated uh, also in many of the missions we uh, are conducting in the south. And uh, uh, Sweden just announced that they will uh, contribute more also to the NATO counterterrorism fund. So, so actually, I'm absolutely certain that this will benefit not only the north, but the whole uh, of the alliance. Uh, then I think I've covered all uh, questions. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, it's all, uh, and then let me just end by saying for me, it is always a pleasure to meet you, and I really mean it. Uh, because you are so important for the strength of this alliance. Without uh, parliaments uh, in our back, without uh, parliaments supporting us, uh, the efforts of NATO allies, there is no way that NATO can continue as the most successful alliance in history. So I thank you for your support, for your commitment, and what you do every day to ensure that NATO remains the most successful alliance in history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We promised to have you out of here at 12.50, and it's 12.47, so. Um, but uh, thank you for always being there for us, and thank you for your critical leadership at a very difficult moment here in Europe. Um, uh, we know we're in steady hands having Jens Stoltenberg as the Secretary General of our alliance. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. So, we are, let me just fill in, we, we have uh, some business left.